You will sleep better than you have ever slept. You've never been this relaxed. Are you ready to change your life? I'm Rusty Diamond, certified hypnotist. You don't need to leave your house. You can stay in your bed. You can stay in your favorite chair. You just need a computer or your phone. And you can get a hold of me. Stay at home. I'll make your life better. Hypnosis is great.com. It's Rusty Diamond, motherfucker. It's Rusty Diamond, motherfucker. Yo, man. Well, Miss Rusty, what is happening, everybody? Welcome to the Public Access Podcast, the P Podcast, now Pennsylvania's P -p -p Podcast. Thank you, everyone, for being here. If you are watching this and you are sick of my face already, but you love the content, love the guests, go to most anywhere you listen to podcasts, search the Public Access Podcast. If you are listening to this and you think, oh, well, you know what? I, I could I could watch this. I could watch it. Go to YouTube or Rumble. Type in the Public Access Podcast. And there'll be a bunch that are going to show up. Take your pick. Take your pick. And thank you, everyone, again, for being here. If you want to find me, um, rustydiamond.net or hypnosisisgreat.com. And... If you are looking for me to get my guest on, you know what? It's that time. So it's time for me to bring on my special guest right here and right now. And my special guest right here and right now is Jim Salvucci. Thank you for being here, Jim. How are you doing today? Okay. Thanks for having me, Rusty. Yeah, man. Heck yeah. Uh, you are welcome. It's uh friday i mean whatever that means in anybody's life i don't know i don't know friday's another day um what what's Good friday day. mean to you friday means that i've got the weekend coming and get to do a little relaxation what's that look like for you relaxation yeah what's relaxation look like for uh, you mostly hang out with my wife i've got a couple of friends who live nearby we might hang out with them it's beautiful here this weekend so gorgeous day i live in upstate new york it's gorgeous so okay so how i mean upstate new york is a it's a it's a vast area it's a vast area <laughs> and it can it can mean a lot of different things depending on where yeah where you live um i mean upstate could be 10 minutes outside the city uh you know as well yeah. as uh you know Niagara Falls or something. Um, in terms of official designations, I'm not in upstate. Upstate's north of here, but I'm in the mid Hudson. Okay. Yeah. So then that okay. Yeah, it's it's always interesting to hear that part. Um but yeah, I, I like it uh I like it up that way. It's kind of nice. So yeah. um okay. And so let's see. So I mean, yeah, Friday. Friday, Friday. Uh, are you are you a Monday through Friday eight to five kind of a thing, or what's are you, are you up at like work? Start working at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, with, <laughs> no, I'm know, I'm self employed. Um, so I am up. You know, I get up early. I start working around eight. I pretty much quit around six, but I take breaks. Um, because that's what I preach in my business, and um, I do tend to work on weekends but I don't have to all the time. And I, I do a lot of writing. So that happens a lot on weekends. So when you're taking your breaks, is that getting up, walking around? Is that? Yeah, it could be anything. And, it could uh, be getting some exercise, going for a walk. It could be just getting up, doing a little movement. Um, I've, I've taken up ukulele in my, my dotage. So I might bang on the ukulele for a couple of minutes, which I find very relaxing. So what, uh, 
how how that happened? How did you get into uh, ukulele in? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I used to try to play guitar when I was younger, and I never had the patience. And then I decided, you know, I'm getting older. I should pick up an instrument and see it. And ukulele only has four strings, so it's a lot easier. Did you find one somewhere, or do you seek it out? Uh, were you at like at a a shop or no, something? No, I, and I bought it online. It was I decided to just look go for it. It was during COVID. You know, people picked up things during COVID. They picked right. up COVID and they picked up the instruments. Yeah, and so then okay, so during then you were able to. And it was, so, what was your what was your learning style then? I guess were you going on to YouTube and uh, copying someone? what yeah. they're doing there's cool. like youtube okay. instructors you know that kind of thing and that's how i picked up the basics and then i started just using apps to get the chords and and whatnot i play a kind of guitar style i don't i don't really care for the ukulele junka 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 style yeah okay that's cool and so like yeah. i mean uh i'm i'm a big fan of youtube university that's so uh, yeah. yeah i mean i definitely have gotten multiple certifications that way um well self-certification uh no actual paperwork but uh, affirmations learn, affirmations yeah. yeah i love it i love youtube um and i mean this kind of goes into also with what with what you do with um i mean don't stop learning don't there's no need to stop learning but there's there's other ways. There's other ways to learn things, and there's anything out there you could ever want. Yeah. Uh, and it's free. I yeah. mean, for the most part, I mean, you got you have YouTube. You can't find it on YouTube. I mean, there's a uh, Harvard, there's Stanford, there's MIT. But you can find uh, that on YouTube as well. So. It, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, okay. So then yeah, you got YouTube on there. I mean, um, years ago I heard you, and this is a long time ago. I heard YouTube described as the archive of our culture. And that's right. more true now than it was back then. You yeah. Know? And I love it. I love that there's all this information just kind of right here. I mean, it's, it's a lot easier than, you know, what we had to do. And I couldn't imagine the simplicity and streamlining of, what would go on um i think i would have learned how to get it. i mean to be honest if i was in middle school high school right now i would have all my work done i would have ai do every bit of it and then i would I would go and learn something else and just do enough just to get like all that done out of my way so I can go and focus on something else. And that's kind of still kind of what I think I would do if I was doing some sort of schooling now. Um, well, as a, just a former to, college professor, that cuts me to the core. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, and it's, I don't know. Cause yeah, I mean, I was, I went to college for a while and, and that was 20 years ago, at least. Um, and I, I don't know. I don't think that I got what I got everywhere else. But I also, like, I don't know, like, what, what I was going to school for was kind of useless, I guess, in the hindsight. And it's, and yeah, like, my, my, um, sister-in-law is a professor and she was saying that i think she had uh she got a whole bunch of papers turned in and she could tell a lot of them were uh made by a computer <laughs> and uh said you know like i'm gonna give everyone a zero if you want to right now you can go and turn it in and i'll give you another chance um you know no questions asked and then no one really even did that. It just sort of just, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe she won't catch me, but yeah. um, so then, so you were a college professor and then you, I mean, so were you, I mean, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, getting through to the, the students in a way, or cause I mean, if it was college, I mean, they should be there for, 
some sort of reason but then in actuality i mean like how many people are going because it's i mean i ask people this now why they're going to college and i had some kid and i don't know i think he was in college at the time and i asked him and it was basically like I don't know. Basically, I, I said like, well, so you're going because you you don't know what you're doing. You're going to college to go to college. And it's just like, well, like I don't have, you know, basically it was his parents would pay for it yeah. and he doesn't have to do shit for four years. No, I mean, you're still doing stuff, but yeah. so what, what got you into wanting to be a college professor? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't my first career, but, um, I'd always wanted to do it. Um, I just, I was a, an English professor. I just loved studying literature. So I just wanted to do what I love and what I was good at. And I wanted to teach other people those skills, right? Yeah. You know, because you learn and, how to think and write and research and do all these practical things. Right. And so, and but okay. So, I mean, you got people with a bunch of different learning styles and stuff. And how were you able to kind of, adapt to that or did everyone kind of have to adapt to your style? Yeah. And I, I mean, the learning style things kind of, it's kind of been debunked. Like everyone has their learning style, but no one has a single learning style and you know, they, they can be circumstantial and you don't have to actually match the teaching style to the learning style. People can adapt pretty easily. I mean, but you mix it up, you know, you, yeah. you, you try to do a little visual, you try to do some stuff that's written down. You try to do some stuff that's just oral you know, the, the, the other one is the kinesthetic, right? Where you, what's physical, Hands yeah, on. you know, you don't want to be touching students, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I avoided that one, like the plague, but That's you know, good. it's, it's, it's not a, it's not so set in stone, although they still, and this kind of ticks me off. They still teach that in like teacher training. They teach learning styles and you got to match the learning style. And that has been utterly debunked for decades. And so then why hasn't, I mean, you, there's <laughs> A trillion different answers that I could say um, about like why it has not been updated. Um, uh, but I, could, I mean, I could go on and on about it. <laughs> yeah. Well. Well. I mean, please do. I mean, uh, I uh, could go. Know, yeah. There's a, because a lot of a lot of the way and and I used to I would I became an administrator and I I actually oversaw education programs, big ones, um, and they do a lot of good in terms of producing teachers, but they also they're, they're so set in their ways. They're so kind of just locked in. Everything's about meeting standards, right? You have these national accreditations, you have state accreditations you got to meet that are set by outside bureaucracies. And so you got to match them. And if they say learning styles is in, then you got to deal with learning styles. It doesn't hurt. You know, like the learning style thing doesn't hurt anyone, right? but it is a waste of time. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, I'm from Oregon. Um, and I mean, so like with Oregon, you don't need to be proficient in reading, um, writing or math to be able to be advanced to the next grade anymore. Yeah. And that's I a... mean, that, but that does, that raises yeah. those graduation uh, rates yeah. and it uh, makes sure that, you know, those numbers are being hit. But you want to, do you want to hear about Goodhart's law? Oh, please. Which is the reason yes. behind that, like this is this is something I don't know why more people don't notice this, but um, there's a, it's an it's it comes from like a 1970s economist named Goodhart, and it's been adapted many times, but the idea is that, just in layman's terms, if if you set a measure as your goal, right, a number as your goal, then people then the goal kind of becomes or the measure becomes irrelevant, right. Because right. people tend, and I my codicil to that is people tend to game the system. So a classic example is um, when like like a state police force has a ticket quota. Oh, know? okay, yeah. And they're supposed. Why do you have tickets? Well, ostensibly to get people to stop driving fast, right? You're you're so right. you don't so they're not a danger to society, right? But then they cluster like you see all these cops at the end of the month clustered on the side of the road, you know, giving out tickets. Well, that's hardly a deterrent for three weeks out of the month. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it defeats the purpose. That's a perfect example of Goodhart's law, where you're kind of like the measure, getting this number, hitting this number becomes more important than the actual goal, which is to slow people down. It's the same yeah, thing yeah. with standardized tests and education. That's why you have schools teaching to the test. You have teachers teaching to the test. You have 
people cheating. You have entire school districts cheating on standardized tests. Why? Because their funding is tied to the grade those students get on those standardized tests. Their prestige is tied to that grade. But that grade is a measure, not a goal. And since right. you're and using I, the measure as a goal, you know, you end up gaming the system. Yeah. And it's only really just to remember it to forget it uh, in a way. I mean, there's so much of that test, like, you know, studying for that, that mm -hmm. way is just to have those things only in that. I mean, not, how much of that's getting put into your long-term memory? Um, None. None. Yeah, it's just there. Just <laughs> yeah. get it until the the third week of whatever uh, yeah. on a Saturday. Get it to then, and then you can never have to think about this ever again in your yeah. life. You know, maybe yeah. maybe you go on Jeopardy, it might show up somewhere, but um, probably not. And it's yeah. it's ridiculous. There's so much of that that it's not meant to go into your long term i mean the, the the main thing is supposed to go into your long term is that you know it was set by the i i always forget i want to say it's the rockefellers that started the school system um if it wasn't the rockefellers it was i mean like shoot. the public school system the public school system um i don't know I it was believe, any one group is kind of a state by but, state thing i think so what i heard was it was that they kind of spearheaded it to get it so you have the eight hours a day, five days a week for 12 years because it takes that amount of time to, uh, in your subconscious, unconscious memory, indoctrinate someone fully with an idea, which would be able to give them the best workers to get ready for that five hours or five days a week, eight hours a day. Uh, you know, lifetime until they're I, at that time was you know not not the age it is now, but um, yeah, it takes yeah, twelve hours or twelve years, five days a week, eight hours a day to indoctrinate someone, kind of you know unknowingly, but right, it works. Um, yeah, I I pretty sure it's Rockefeller. If it's not Rockefeller, it is someone. Uh -huh. Just like it, but yeah. Um, I have no idea. But I don't know. Um, that's kind of how it goes, I guess. Um, yeah. So yeah, he... Uh, okay, so it was him. It was Rockefeller, and he created the General Education Board at the ultimate cost of $129 million and provided major funding for schools across the nation Wow. and very influential in shaping the school system. So I mean, yeah, you got... When was that? Uh, I think it said 1929. Okay. So, um, yeah. yeah well, what a year too to have. Yeah, yeah, just that. To, just in time to crash the economy. Right. Yeah. Interesting. I, I didn't put that <laughs> together until just now. I was like, oh, okay, 1929, huh? So, um, yeah, I mean, that kind of makes sense. And so, what what was it that? And you probably answered this a, a bunch of times, but uh, what was it that got you to? Be like, hey, I need to take a step back. I guess not what got you to finally leave, but what got you to start questioning, like, it might be time for me to get out, or I'm seeing stuff here that I'm not fully on board with. Yeah. Well, I became an administrator, right? So I became a dean, and then I was a provost at a couple of different colleges, right? So number two to the president. And I got to see higher ed leadership up close and personal. Um, and there's, I mean, there's almost a hostility to the notion of leadership in higher ed. And some of my former colleagues would be appalled to hear me say that, but it's true. And I, I have sure. receipts. Um, and I had one, I actually did work for a president who was fabulous for one year and then he retired. It was, it was a disaster for me um, Yeah, because a new guy came yeah. in and cleaned house. But um, the, yeah, so he was, he was wonderful. He was the best boss I ever had. He's really, a, he was a true leader. He'd been doing that for 22 years. Whoa. Um, and, you know, and he, he was just great. But what was know, it? Hmm? Uh, what was it about him that made him so yeah, great he about? Was, he was, um, he was just very, um, he was honest, frankly, and he took responsibility. <laughs> you know, he didn't, it wasn't about his ego, which was a big deal. It wasn't about his ego. Um, it was about, 
getting the job done, doing right by the students, doing right by the university at all times. But the, the, you know, it was stacked against him even at that time. Um, yeah. you know, it's just, the whole system is stacked against him. He was kind of a, kind of a freak out there. I have, I have another, I had a friend who became a president of a very elite school, not too far from where you are. And, um, she took over as president and it turned out there was a massive hole in the budget. And by massive, I mean, millions. Oh. She's brand new and she did the right thing. She called the press, right? What they usually do is they're, oh, don't tell anybody. Blah, 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 blah. And now you've got two problems. You've got the problem of the, that you have, right? The financial problem. Right. And you also have a publicity problem. Now you're covering something up. You know, why would you do that? So she immediately called the press and wow. gave an interview and ended that problem right then and there. Nobody cared after that. Right. And so, right. and I right, took that off the table. The board was furious with her. And so, like bet. blaming her for the prop for the hole in the budget, which she couldn't possibly have created. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, this is typical. This is how these things go. You know, if you try to do the right thing, the board is against you. You're just bucking the system. The board is not interested generally in the institution as an institution of education. They're interested right. in fundraising. Their, their priorities are like in no particular order, fundraising, sports, and the business program. If you have one. They obsess right. over the business program because bottom line, uh, well, they think that's line. what they know. They're all business people and they think, Oh, the business program, you know, they, they're knuckleheads about it. Yeah. And I mean, it's kind of that way. Like if you bring in someone in, like they obviously knew that there was a huge hole in the, the budget. You can't just kind of yeah do that. And so I mean, maybe, maybe they were having her, you know, they hired her because they, thought that it would be easy to start to pin it on her that's what or, it looked like <laughs> and, yeah and, and then she went ahead and like you know did the right thing and they weren't expecting that right um, and so the, the press was was happy uh or yeah. you know the press but the people who read they're like oh wow like look what she did uh yeah that, and, it was yeah. very cool i never seen anything like it it was very cool and yeah yeah i mean so and what happens then after that? Like, what, where, where's the, are they, are they like going after her, you know, trying to. Yeah. I mean, there's been all the things. I don't want to say then. too much because I don't want to out sure. the college, you could, you know, but yeah, um, it was, it, she was, um, yeah, there were other things that were her predecessor's fault that she kind of took the fall for things that she couldn't possibly have even begun to move the needle on, um, yeah. you know, and she's just been embattled ever since she's still there, but she's still embattled. You know, it's been and, years of this. And yeah, so here and, you have somebody who actually wants to lead and they stack the deck against her. And that's kind of the thing, like with that too, like if you do, you want to go and like disrupt the system. One thing is you do have to work with a bunch of dickheads yeah. and like every day, every day you have to go in and do that. Like mm -hmm. I, I got into politics for a second and then that's what I learned. I was like, well, I'm, I want to make this stuff better then. Then it was like, I have to work with these people every day. Yeah. No, these people suck. These people yeah. are are horrible. I don't want to spend my time doing this. It's not not worth it. There needs to be something to change, but that's not the way to do it. Um for me. Uh if she can she can hang with it, like that's all more power to her. I mean, that's that's a hell of a fucking uh deck of cards to be fucking kind of. Yeah, trying to work but, but it's there. devastating. It's personally devastating because I went through yeah. much the same thing, trying not to be the dick in the room right. with all these all these people who are dicks. And, yeah. um, you know, and believe me, you don't have to say anything. If you just don't conform to their assholery. Right. You're the asshole. Right. right? You exactly. don't have to do anything. You don't have to say just don't be like them. And they're pissed because they know who they are deep down yeah. inside. They know they're they're corrupt to their core. Right. And if it's not going to be you, it's going to be someone else. There's, there's a line of people who would love exactly. to be that person, just that next person in line uh, to yep. climb that yep. little ladder and yeah. get there. And which is why I do what I do. Yeah. And so then you were just one day where was it, was it like one, one big thing that happened or was it like yeah, I got a fired. Bunch of... That was a big thing. <laughs> oh, okay. That'll do it. I was a provost. I got fired. I was never told why I know why. 
because it was yeah. it was there was a there was another vice president who had it in for me from the day I started and had the ear of the president. And the president was incompetent; doesn't do it justice. Um, a, a, a wall would be more accurate. Oh uh, shit! Okay. But, yeah, and I was I ended up I was her number two, so I ended up picking up a lot of the slack, just ceremonial stuff. You know, events, she's not there. And it's like, what the hell? And I got to like step up and, you know, oh, be the yeah. host or whatever. It was bizarre. Um, And then one day she walks in my office and says, I want you out of here in two weeks. I was like, what? <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, and... it was really weird. It was, it, and I said, why? And she was like, I just do. You know, it's just, there was no reason. And so were you, I mean, what was going through your head at that point? Was it like, uh, was it? Oh shit! To, okay. Yeah, well, or it was, was it shit? But it was at the same time, it was a little bit of relief because it was horrible working with those people. I mean, yeah. they were really bad people doing very bad things to students. I mean, they were. I actually thought about reporting them to the Department of Ed. Um, I seriously looked into it and uh, decided not to because too many good people would be hurt. But I thought they were doing bad things financially. What, what do you mean people like that would be kind of in the crossfire that were a part well, of it? There's, there's, or, there, they had a fabulous faculty. They had a yeah. lot of great staff members. This would have damaged the college, if not destroyed it, if it were investigated. So I decided it wasn't, and in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't the worst thing I've ever seen. Right. So. Uh, well, I mean, what was, was it the other one that you're talking about? That was the. The worst one, or was it something well, else? Well, it's just, yeah, I can't get too into it, but yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's, some, that's fair. There were some things. <laughs> yeah, and, design stuff, you know. Yeah, well, it's okay, so then, I mean, does that go into, I don't know, with with your, your next point of your life, I mean, it's all, it's all stuff. And so like you have full like NDAs with, with them where you can't. Yeah. I can't like, go into it. You can't even okay. talk about stuff like that. Yeah, it's, You can't, I mean, this is, is it, this disgusting thing. This is what you do. Is it and, and this is, Yeah. Oh yeah. It's like in perpetuity. And it, these things can extend deep into like, you know, to people's spouses. Uh, you can't say things. About, it's, it's crazy. It is crazy. Wow. These agreements. Yeah. They're, that's they're, something you sign first day. Bad. And this is why bad. No, it's it's when you're leaving usually. Well, it's oh, it's your time okay. First guy. But and then, yeah, and and then it becomes, um, you know, it becomes like a way of covering up really dirty stuff, really dirty stuff. Um, yeah, you know, sexual harassment, the whole not, you know, that kind of thing. You witness stuff, and you're you're like you're not allowed to say anything. Wow. And so then, yeah, then it's like, uh, you know, we'll. You're not going to get uh, like a severance unless you sign this thing. That's one and... way they do it. Yeah, yeah, they buy, and if you do something after you get the severance, they they yank it back. They can pull it back. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I'm getting too far into this. I don't want to talk. Okay. <laughs> no, that that's fair. That's fair. Um, and so, so then you left, and so what what's going through your head as you get out to your well, I, apply, I mean, I actually didn't leave higher ed. I, I was applying for jobs, but this was actually happened moments before COVID shutdowns, right? And then okay. colleges went to hell in a handbasket. And I sure. can talk, and I can tell you why they did. It's a very simple reason why they, they they did it so badly, they handled that badly, is because I have this saying that if everything's a crisis, nothing's a crisis. And by that I mean, like if you treat everything like you know your hair's got to be on fire, then there's no way to prioritize. And a lot of higher ed operates on that, right? The phone rings and everybody's like, oh my God, oh my God. You know, it just really, yeah. it, it, like everybody's trying to out crisis each other. I got to deal with this thing, you know, and they're trying to be more important than they are. And when a real crisis comes along, yeah, they don't know what to do. They lose their heads. And this is a perfect example. Like these, these schools really had no way of coping. So they did, they did this knee jerk thing with online learning, but online learning's, very complicated thing to do. You can't just like throw professors in front of a camera and say, now you're learning online. There's, there's right. lots of things that need to go in place. And this, and this happened at every level of the education system. And some of it was, they had no choice. You know, it just was the circumstance, but part of it is just poor. Like if they had better crisis management skills, 
they could have yeah. at, maybe at first it would have been a disaster, but then they could have gotten it together. And it was just a disaster all the way through. They never really come up with another solution. They had no, and I was applying for jobs at the time. And they were literally like, they advertise a job, interview me. And then I was supposed to find out there's another interview and they weren't getting back to me because, oh, we're too busy with this because there's so much we have to do. And it's like, seriously, seriously, yeah. like you, you're, you're that much in crisis that like HR, which has nothing to do with academics, HR can't respond to an email. They were just like ghosting me. And I thought, and I realized, my God, wow. I hate this. I can't stand being with this. Um, there's, there's no logic. There's no there, the, <laughs> principles. Forget that. Um, it's all about getting through the moment. And I mean, yeah, like, and so then this would have been, like you said, like, somewhere close to March, 2020, somewhere in there. Yeah. And this was, you know, subsequent, Ish. like a year after it was okay. kind of went on. So what, what was it that you, I mean, you got to pick up your ukulele more. Uh, what was it like when you saw that things were going to be different? Uh, were you, what, what you do? What, what was your kind of reaction to? Well, I decided everything? I was going to be professional ukulele music. No, it was, I, I decided, huh. I, I started thinking about, what I wanted to do. And I realized one thing, I'm a lousy employee. I, I just am. I'm a bad employee. I had that one great boss, but I'm I'm a bad employee because I'm going to tell you like it is. <laughs> they don't like that. They don't like that very no much. Likes that. One way or the other, you're going to find out from me what, what it is. And and no one really likes that. And and you know, yeah. and so and 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 in being principled, people say you're arrogant. And maybe I am, but I'm no more arrogant than the person sitting there, you know acting pompous all the time and acting like they, they are never to be questioned. But, right. um, you know, so there's that. And I also realized that the thing I love, and I really love being an administrator, I have to say. I love solving problems. I love I love leading. I love getting people, to, you know, motivating people, inspiring people. But one of my favorite things to do was to work with young leaders and help them become great leaders. So I went out of my way to mentor people in order to help them become really great leaders. Um, and I said, well, that's what I want to do because, you know, the, one of the problems, and it's not just a higher ed problem. It is not a higher ed problem. It, it's a, a universal problem. One of the problems we have in this world is bosses suck pretty universally, right? Well, yeah. to me, the opposite of a boss is a leader. And so my goal is to take the, today's young bosses and guide them to become the next generation of great leaders. And it's exponential, right? I train yeah. five people. They each try train five people. Compound interest. Yeah, and I mean, so then, what what happens to them? Like, not to give away your, your program uh, too much, but like, if if they come across come across something of, they're put in the situation where it's going to be, uh, you know, they're being put in like what your friend was put in, where there's not really a win. Um, yeah, and it's hard. They're just, I, you know, there's no, there's no universal answer. Um, you know, sometimes there is no win. Sometimes the the win is get the hell out. Unfortunately, yeah. Um, you know, you you can't. It's not a survivable situation. So avoid those situations. But the thing is, don't lie to yourself. Right. For a while, I lied to myself. Yeah, it's not that bad. Eh, maybe it's me. Maybe I need to adapt. And then I realized, no, 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 no. This is not. This is not right. And people would say to me, why don't you just, just, just conform? I mean, you know, they never use that word, but that's right. what they're saying. Just, just make nice over here and don't worry about that little thing over there. Well, that little thing over there affects students in a really negative way. Students aren't graduating because of what that person is doing. I'm not happy with that. Yeah, right. That's a, that's a big, big problem. That's a big right one, there. Right? Yeah. You know, I'm not happy with that. I'm not going to suck it up to make nice. I'm not going to go in guns a blazing. I'm not, you know, that's, that's not a point, but I'm going to do everything I can to help those students and subvert what this person's doing. And that gets you in trouble. Right. And yeah, that's also, yeah. Why you uh, start working on your own and, um, yeah. and much more content. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you got a problem with the boss, you know, then, then it's on you. It's <laughs> that's what it's that's whole... one, one, of the, one of the deans who, who worked for me used to say that the last job I had, you say, if if the if the you have, if you have a problem with the boss, the boss has a problem with you. You've got the problem, and it's like yeah. 
yeah, okay. He was also a guy who wanted to sort of suck up to the boss all the time. Um, and he did. And he got what he wanted. He got a better position after I left and all that. But was he doing right by people? No. Yeah. And I mean, some people I think are can totally be fine with that and like put that to compartmentalize that and be like, yeah, that's just kind of how it goes. Like that's, that's the game. That's the game. Yeah. I'm winning. I'm winning the game. I'm doing, yeah. I'm doing great. Uh, but you know, whatever, like uh, ca casualty of war. But... Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know. It's hard, but then when you can't do it, it's people can look at you like you're crazy. Yeah. Well, and that's it. it's, it's on you. It's not the bad behavior of these other people. they admit there's bad behavior. Right. It's like when, so I went to the university of Toronto for my, for my doctorate. And when okay. I lived in Canada, I got this sort of education. I moved there from, from New York city. Right. Yeah. And big difference. Right. Moved to Toronto. And I, one time I was waiting for a bus and there's this long, what they call a queue, right? A line of people waiting to get yeah. on the bus and Canadians are great for queuing up. They love to queue up, but there's sure always some, some jerk who like sneaks on early and pretends he doesn't see the line. So, you know, somebody would do that every time, right? They would get in the bus and I'd be in like somewhere in the line. And I'd yell, yo, what are you doing? We're all waiting here. Everybody would look at me and he would get on the bus scot-free. They would look at me. And yeah. that's, and that's exactly, that's a metaphor for the way it works, right? If you call it out, you're the bad guy, not the person actually, not the perpetrator. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Who doesn't love to shoot the messenger? Right. And that's what it is. And so, when you're in you're in those situations, and this is why it's so hard to cope. Um, you know, if you try to do the right thing, you try to have integrity, no matter how you do it, and you don't have to be a jerk about it, you don't have to be an arrogant about it or anything like that. If you try to do it, people come after you. And so the best thing to do is get out. Leave the line. Yeah. Well, <laughs> now you're going back to my metaphor. So good for you. But no, uh, yeah, I mean, you know. Or in, in that situation, it's probably just best to shut up because who cares? But um, when it when it's something when something's really bad going on, you know, it's not survival. It's not. Yeah, and uh, I mean, yeah, calling people out on shit like yes, yeah, the uh, people the immediate response for ninety percent of the people is yeah, whoever is calling that person out, like it's them. Like, yeah. why aren't they? Everyone else seems to be fine. Like yeah. what? What's up with them? What's going right. on? Why? Why are they? Why do they have a problem? If it's what's well, going to be an extra thirty seconds, I have to wait, uh, or you know, thirty seconds of inconvenience, and I mean, don't you, make you, waves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just it, let it all go. That's what I used to get told all the time by people. It's like it would be advising me, you know, just don't worry about that thing. It's like this isn't a small thing. Right, this is a big thing. I'm, I'm not going after little things. You know, I'm not yeah. literally going after people waiting who, who didn't you know, buck the line. I'm talking about big things that hurt people, that hurt institutions. Um, yeah, that's unacceptable. It, yeah, and and but then yeah, then you're the person who's the one that's unacceptable. You become the person who's unacceptable because right. you're like, uh, how dare people are thinking? How dare someone say that there there is bad things not perfect things going on in this realm of the world yeah. and you know that it's it's against me you're you're attacking me right. uh, or something right. i love and that's the other um, thing when you when you do that you also have to be willing to accept criticism right yeah so you can't, it can't be a hypocrite so when i was doing that i also was willing to accept criticism and i listened to people's ideas and whatnot and i you know and i made adjustments as i could you know as, as necessary but if they were just telling me nah compromise your principles and hurt people nah i wasn't doing that <laughs> yeah yeah no no one needs to be doing that and yeah. i mean there's a lot of people that that will there's a lot of people i mean their their bottom line where they get into life uh physically and in whatever kind of thing to be able to go up that next little step like it's probably better for them to keep their mouth shut like if uh 
Like I don't know, and fucking wrestling and comedy, there there's so much the horrible shit going on that so many people will just shut up and not say anything because you know their person higher up is doing horrible things, but yeah. I don't want to say anything because like, that's how I'm going to get up to that next level. That's how I'm going to yeah. succeed here. So yeah. I'm, I'm just going to shut up. Um, yeah. And I mean, yeah, and look, I no don't, one's yeah. perfect. People make mistakes. People go down the wrong path, you know, but if you're not willing to, to hear criticism, you're not willing to be corrected. Right. You're by definition corrupt. You don't have to be taking money on the side. That's a form of corruption. Right. And so, you got to hold yourself to a higher standard. It's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. And I come up short all the time. But you you can say that you come up short all the time and that then you can accept criticism and that you can adjust what your reality is, what your, you know, it's not something that's concrete. If you say something that I don't agree with, I fucking throw my hands up and cover my ears or something, right. you know, you're open to, to have that dialogue and, you know, see where things can be improved for the betterment of everyone. And, and, you know, sometimes you're wrong. Sometimes you're not totally right. Sometimes you're fully right. And no one gives a fuck or, you know, right. It's there's, it's all over the place and it's, and it's okay every way, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to, let some things go through and some things to go unchecked. Sometimes you got to say something. And so you got out of there, you started being a ukulele pro um, <laughs> and, and having uh, your business. So was your business, was it kind of started right away? Where did you go? Uh, yeah, I guess I mean, after that year, a few and... manifestations. Um, I originally thought I would work, with leadership in nonprofits. Cause I've been on boards. My wife, my, my wife's work for nonprofits and I knew they needed a lot of leadership help. Um, but the problem with nonprofits is they don't want to pay you for anything. Right. Uh, yeah. You, you want know? to volunteer your time. <laughs> right. So there's, there's <laughs> grants available to them. And I was talking to foundations like, Oh yeah, we write grants for that stuff all the time. You know, we'd love to do that. Um, or they, they don't write them all the time that we have them available, but people don't, don't ask for them because, they want to write grants for new programs and things like that, which is a, a cycle that nonprofits get in all the time. They expand their programs to get, they, they want money. So they expand their programs to get grants. And then the grants run out, but now they got this program. And now what do we do on and on? It's just a, and that's just bad leadership. That's bad leadership. Yeah. Um, Short-term thinking. Um, You know, so I, I looked into that for a good while. And then I realized this is just a dead end. Um. I'd moved to a new area. I was trying to make connections. It was all during COVID. So that was a little hard. And then I, um, and then as, as I evolved, I realized I needed to be more industry agnostic. So I'm pretty much open. And then I started focusing more and more on younger people because I realized I needed to get people before they were broken. So I mostly work with people like millennials, people who are not, you know, really, who are sort of new to bossing who want to be good leaders. Yeah. And so then, uh what was kind of your your style to find people um at, yeah. at first was it um because i mean there's so many different avenues of that when you you have a new service for people um how are you kind of finding those yeah, first well, few that's, that, that's a steep learning curve um, the marketing thing um you know, so yeah, I mean, some of it's through networking. I, I, I'm actually contract with an organization that actually supplies people from corporations, um, which isn't particularly lucrative, but it, it it's a good thing to do. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm now trying to move more onto LinkedIn and start doing marketing there and get more people that way. Um, it's, you know, but when, once you start getting referrals, then it sort of takes off. But yeah, I'm also it's... moving more toward speaking and writing. So I'm, I'm shifting my emphasis. I'm going to continue to coach because I love coaching and I'm good at it. Yeah. But I also want to get more on stages, give, give talks, get on podcasts like this and, um, and, uh, 
do do some writing. So I'm talking to a publisher right now. I'm trying to get have you out. written already? Have you started writing already on it? Yeah. So I have I have a um podcast blog. Um, it started out as a blog, and I write these essays, and then I read them aloud because some people like to listen to them. Cool. Um, and I do that on a weekly basis, and I've got uh, oh, almost 190 of those. So oh, okay. um, they're pretty polished, high quality essays. So there's a publisher wants to make an offer to me to, to compile some of these as, as a book. Um, so yes and no, I've got it written, but I've got a lot of work to do to get into a book shape. Cool. That's awesome. Um, so then that, yeah, that kind of, I guess you have it all written now. I usually like asking authors kind of about the writing process, but that's your writing process is so different, uh, yeah, it's which totally is, different. is great. And yeah. um, I like that a lot. And so uh, with speaking though, so this is something that I'm kind of learning now. So with these speaking engagements, uh, they have these online summits. Have you, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm finding out that a lot of those are pay to play. Yeah. A lot, a lot, well, a lot of speaking gigs are too. A lot of podcasts it, are. Yeah, I, I was crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> and I, I don't know why I'm not doing it, but like, why well, wouldn't know. be on I, it? <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't be on it either. I have people saying I had someone say like uh, they wanted like two hundred and fifty dollars to be on a podcast, and yeah. then I had someone I asked to be on a podcast, and they said it was the two hundred dollar fee for them to appear on the podcast. And I'm like, who the fuck are you? Like, it's like what, it's, well, like, if you're using if you're using that for your marketing, it makes sense, right? So if I was sure. if, if if I thought that my my best audience was a certain podcast that had a big audience and my people were there and I could reach them paying $250 is a bargain. Sure. Right. I, you know, okay, I'll get on it. And do... the problem is you really have to know that your audience is there and receptive and you're going to be able to get your message across the same thing with speaking. You know, if you know that paying to get on a stage is a good way to market. Sure. Why not? Um, yeah. but it's, it is, yeah, it, it's not for me. It's not what I do. It's yeah. not how I work. Because if if I'm going somewhere, if I'm going to be on on a stage speaking, I'm I'm want to get paid. Yeah. I don't. I'm not going to pay someone unless it's like some. Yeah, there has to be very very few opportunities that like I would pay to do it. But there's so many. It's just like this. Not much going on, and it's like, well, why why am I fucking paying for this? Like, I get a video or something like. Well, yeah, maybe, I mean, that's part but of it. like, and you get in front of an audience and yeah. you get, it gives you credibility if it's a prestigious gig. Right. Um, right. and that might get you other gigs you've got, but the other thing that's, that's more common is you don't get paid at all. Right. So you, you're not paid anything. Right. And, and you, you, and if you have to travel, you've got those expenses. Yeah. So you're paying anyhow. And, and, but you want to do those things because you need to get your name out there. You're not going to get gigs unless you get gigs. Absolutely. Right? And that's, yeah. that's the problem. So like, I'm, I'm going to be speaking in a week and a half, um, in New Jersey. And this does, this is not a paid gig, but they are covering my travel expenses, which aren't going to be considerable, but they're putting me up overnight in a hotel and giving me dinner and all that, which is nice. That's Tolls actually on the turnpike. Gig. I'm sorry. Tolls on the turnpike. Yeah. But they pay for that. So they're, yeah, pay okay. for my, you know, they'll pay for my gas and all that. So, you know, that's, that's great. That that's a good gig. I'm not getting paid. I couldn't make a living doing that, but I'm breaking even. It's yeah, a good use I, of my time. Yeah. That's a fair one. That's a, I, I feel that would be a good one. And so what are you speaking out or not speaking out, speaking on, on that? Uh, so I'm, I'm one. speaking to, um, so I'm, I'm going to be speaking on leadership, which is what I do. And I have something I call the four C's of leadership. It's one of my signature talks. So there's okay. four, four elements of leadership. Um, you know, so a lot of <laughs> people think that leadership is complex. Leadership is like dumbfoundingly easy conceptually. It's yeah. incredibly hard to implement and even harder to maintain, right? That's right. the hard part is putting it in practice. But there's all these, these lessons and books and essays about these, these lists of leadership rules and whatnot. And they're all good. They're all valid but they're impossible to do anything with because there's too many. So the human brain can only handle 
on average about four things at a time. And that's kind of high. That's yeah, kind of high. Um, you know, if you're like really on and you're kind of a genius, you might get up to seven, right? But most right. people uh, force yeah. pushing it, right? You're really yeah. pushing it. So I reduced mine, I reduced all them, all these principles down to four. And they all happen okay. to be with the letter C. So that makes it easy. Um, yeah. And do you want me to talk about them? Sure. I, well, I mean, if you 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 don't have to go and give away your your stuff, oh, well, it's not but a I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you I mean, can I talk about it all yeah. the time. So sure. yeah. So it's so the first the want. first one is character, right? Okay. Who you are as a person, your values, right? What kind of person you are, and they build on each other. The second one is communication. Leaders have to be good communicators, and part of communication is your values because you have to have a message, and that message will not have any value if you don't have character. So I'll give you an example. Um, you, you've heard the the fable, the boy who cried wolf. Sure. Right? He comes out. He says, one day he says, I'm going to play a joke. I'm bored. I'm going to say there's a wolf and watch everybody run. Ha, ha, ha. And everybody comes running and there's no wolf. Does it the next day. Everybody comes running. There's no wolf. Third day, there is a wolf and no one comes running. Why? Because his they figure his message has no value because he has no values. He's just a little creepy boy who gets eaten by a wolf. Good for him. Yeah. So that is, you know, that is how character leads to communication. And then yeah. communication leads to compromise. You can't compromise without communication. You need to be able to have an exchange of ideas and compromise is all about give or take, right? You you meet somebody partway, not necessarily halfway. It might be, you know, 80, 80, 20, whatever. But yeah. you owe every, some one person gives and the other person gives and both take. It's very transactional. Um, and you know, it but the but the idea is that you're trying to get something done. And that leads directly to the fourth C, which is collaboration. You can't have collaboration without compromise. And with collaboration, that's when you're in a win-win situation. Right? Competition is the opposite. That's when it's a zero-sum game, right? You watch a baseball right. game and one team's gonna win, one team's gonna lose. That's a zero-sum game. Right. But it's, but, and it would be a boring baseball game, but what if they collaborated? Right. Yeah. Um, if they work they, together, they could achieve more. If the goal is to hit a lot of home runs, well, we could do that. Just the pitchers just toss up, you know, just tee them you, up. So you get the Savannah bananas. Right. <laughs> that, that's so, when you get the, the win win. So, you know, you want, but you want the win, you want the win win situation when you're leadership. You want everybody to come out on top. You want your team to come out on top. And that, that requires collaboration. And so if people want to collaborate with you and find you, how can they do that? They can find me at www.guidanceforgreatness.com. Easy. That's pretty, pretty easy, simple. Easy. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you uh, so much for being on here, Jim. Uh, happy we got to talk about what we got to talk about from whatever it was we were going to go to, to wherever it is we got. So uh, happy for that. So thanks again for being on. I enjoyed getting to talk to you and yeah, hope you have you, a, you bet. Have a great rest of your day. All right. Okay. You too. Bye. All right. Bye. All right. That's uh, Jim Salvucci. So give him a follow, go find him, get that checked out. Four C's. Four C's. Uh, yes. So thank you everyone for listening or watching. You can find me rustydiamond.net or hypnosisisgreat.com. Hypnosis is great. Nah, 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 nah. So thank you everyone for being here. And that is the show. Man. Boom. It's Rusty Diamond, motherfucker. It's Rusty Diamond, motherfucker.